Welcome back, Streamer Nation. You're listening to the SP Streamer Podcast, part of the Fantrax and FantraxHQ.com family. I'm your host, Michael Simeone, and I am here with my wonderful co-host, Lauren Auerbach. What's going on, Lauren? Not much, Michael. I've, I've actually honestly been trying to keep up with all of the uh, MLB moves that were happening before the lockout. And there were there were tons of them, you know? A lot of people were saying that they should do something where, like, it, this has to happen every year. You know, minus the lockout, but like where it's just a rush. So <laughs> right. A lot more entertaining than just waiting several months and it slowly come in, you know? Exactly. I know. It's kind of like all in your face. It reminded me of the uh, trade deadline, you know, which was yeah. such a crazy trade, de- trade yep. deadline, right? So yep. it's just kind yeah. of a continuation of that. Very exciting. Did the, mm-hmm. the Braves didn't do anything yet, right? They did a couple moves. I think they got some... What did get? Manny Pena, like a catcher, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, they did get Pena. Um, and they got, I feel like, one more. It's very low-key compared to lots of these uh, signings. But, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean. They, I think they they still are probably living off of their uh, their trade deadline they're... moves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that bode them well. Nothing so. wrong with that. Yeah. Um, and, and they're not like the Red Sox who are signing a million people. Like, yeah. like That are random. like no names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we have two guests for tonight's episode. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about relievers because both of these young men over here, uh, <laughs> one of them's giving me a thumbs up. Um, uh, they basically focus on that for content and they're both really good at it. So I figured we might as well talk about it. So um, I'll introduce our first guest who is a writer for SP Streamer, the co-host of the St. Victory podcast. And that is Victor Akintola. What's going on, Victor? Hey, I'm doing pretty good tonight. How are you, Michael? I'm not too bad. You know, the Mets did sign some people, but I'm a little pet. I'm that pessimistic fan that just kind of expects it all to, you know, go down in flames. So we'll see. But uh, I'm trying to enjoy it as much as possible right now. <laughs> Generally, I have I feel pretty good about the Rays off season so far. Obviously, with the Juan de Franco extension, mm-hmm. but also Brooks Raley's uh, underlying metrics are, mm-hmm. look really interesting. So I want to yeah. see what the Rays are going to do with that. Which I mean, anytime they make a move, you're just assuming it's a good one. So <laughs> yeah. it's the Rays. Yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> like I know if the Mets ever traded with them, I'd be like, "Oh, great, we just got fleeced. Yep. This sucks." <laughs> so. All right, and our second guest is also writer for SP Streamer, um, but you can also see his work at Roto Fanatic, Fantrax, and Nine Inning Know It All. And that is Mike Carter. What's going on, Mike? Hey, all. How's it going? Happy Thursday. Did, Happy did Thursday. I make, did I make your night by calling you young? Well, it's just a, it's, it's just a straight up lie from you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna start off talking about NFBC ADP. Um, uh, but to before we get to different groupings of relievers here, um, I wanted to ask you both about your overall RP draft strategy coming into um, this fantasy baseball season in 2022. Uh, it's a little tough to really see the landscape right now, obviously, because you got to wait on signings, trade, trades, whatever, you know, a lot of stuff has to be worked out. Um, so we'll start with you, Victor, though. So how are you, as of right now, planning to approach the relief pitching landscape when it comes to drafts? Are you going to be one of those people who are taking, you know, the Hater Hendricks super early right now, like third round? Or are you going to kind of settle for those guys in the middle or wait late? You know, how are you approaching that? Yeah, so I think usually in drafts, I try to grab one really reliable top end reliever and then try to fill out the rest of those spots um, for saves with speculative guys later in drafts. Um, But obviously, it seems as though at least this year, those top end relievers are getting pushed up into even the second round in certain drafts. So I think. Um, I, I wouldn't be taking Liam Hendricks or Josh Hader in the second round, but I think maybe the tier below that, try and grab one of those, uh, higher end relievers and then go with the, the speculative, um, draft picks later in the draft to fill out the roster. So I have to say, I think I, I don't know if it's going to stay. I want to assume it's not, but I really don't think Hendricks and Hader will be going that early when we get closer to the season, just because right now it's, you don't really know who's, you know, there's a lot of relievers that are questionable. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people are just looking at those two, like no matter what they're going to be there. 
Um, so let's grab them early, but we'll kind of talk about them a little more um, in a bit. Uh, what about you, Mike? What's your overall strategy looking like? Well, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I did, I did been doing a little bit of research on this and, and found some interesting things that I'd like to share with the group. I mean, this year we know that we only had, there was nine guys that had 30 saves or more in the, in the major leagues led by the immortal Mark Melanson's 39. Uh, nobody had 40 saves this year. Now, so I went back and was looking through in 2016, just five short years ago, there were five guys that had 40 or more saves and there were 15 that had more than 30. And so you can see clearly that the landscape is really changing, right? And I agree with what you said, Michael. I think right now, um, in closers are going insanely early. Uh, it's you know December second, and I'm wondering if that's going to change as we get into March. I, I would think that it would because we really are looking at needing fewer saves to be competitive in the category, right? So I'm I'm going to kind of piggyback off of what Victor said. And I'm really wanting to get 35, 30 to 35 out of my top guy at the bare minimum. And I'm not going to pay a top value for a top price for a Hader or Hendricks. I'm totally fine with taking a Rizal Iglesias, who I think has got a really clear opportunity. And to me, that's what you're really looking for is, you know, what guys have a really clear opportunity with lot, without a lot of, uh, you know, noise around them in terms of other people who might steal those saves. Now, last year, what I did, and I'm thinking about doing it this year, um, is... I took one one guy that I thought for sure would get somewhere between 30 and 40 saves, and then I double tapped in bullpens. And I, I I don't think it's a bad strategy. It just didn't work for me last year because I chose really poorly. I I did I Colome and Rogers from the Twins, which was a, a big no. And then in another league, I did Sims and Garrett, thinking that I would get all of their saves, and that blew up in my face. And so in those leagues, then I was chasing saves all year. So this year I'm thinking if I can get an Iglesias type in that second tier, like Victor said, oh, there's Jack. Um, and then maybe take, <laughs> maybe double tap in the right bullpen, like maybe Seattle or San Francisco, where I'm fairly certain that I'll get all of those saves if I take those two guys. I could see me trying to get by with a strategy like that. I'm not 100% sold on any strategy yet to answer the question. Mm -hmm. hmm. What are, what are your thoughts, Lauren? Well, it's interesting. Normally, that's kind of the strategy that, that I do, which is what you guys are talking about, where I don't necessarily always pay up for closers. And I'm fine kind of going in that kind of second tier and then grabbing one or two guys um, later. And definitely maybe a, a spec pick at the, at the end of the draft. But I, you know, I'm kind of curious about this year because, you know, because I think that more you know, I think that you're seeing teams spread the saves around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, I think this idea of a reliable closer and is, you know, like what Mike had said is kind of, is kind of fading away. And so I, I wonder if people are going to do the opposite where, you know, do you want to then grab one of those, uh, kind of reliable closers, uh, reliable co closers, you know, I'd say in air quotes. And so, you know, that you have a base, um, and then you can kind of, you know, uh, kind of pick and choose later. Like I, I, I can see people still keep like pushing, pushing the, uh, the closers up in drafts because of that, just because mm -hmm. they want that security of, you know, of a hater or a Hendrix, uh, because the saves are being spread around. So I don't know, like, I'm kind of intrigued by that this season, actually. So what so again, happens? There's still a lot of moving parts, you know. What, right what happens if you take uh, if you say you take Hendricks? You think he's the number mm -hmm. one guy on the board, right? And mm -hmm. say the so say the Sox keep Kimbrel, mm -hmm. and say that yeah. week one, say that week one Tony Larusa says, you know, Kimbrel's really not very good in the eighth, so I'm going to close him, and I'm going to have Hendricks pitch the eighth. Your season's over, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Right, so, but right. I think, I mean, it's kind of a different subject. I'm not a big Kimbrel guy, but sure. um, I. Uh, I don't know. You really see them doing that, though, Mike. No. I just can't fathom but, that. Though. But I have, you know I, mean? I have, I have, I have no. You're luck. just saying by that's, taking. That's that's something that would happen to me is I would spend <laughs> a high pick on Hendricks, and then all of a sudden he like he falls, he trips over a suitcase and breaks his arm. Or, yeah, you know what I mean. It's yeah. just it's the Mike Carter curse. So you know? so right now, <laughs> right now, I think recently a couple of them went in the second round, even. Mm -hmm. Um, last year, the Hendricks hater Chapman went in the fourth round. I could see that going to the third this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's too high. That's too high. I think so too. But I yeah. think, I think it is going to be pushed up, um, just because people just want those reliable closers. And, uh, I think, 
you know, people see that's what Phil Dassault did, so they're going to try and mimic it. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a, a possibility. All right, so let's talk about NFBC ADP. Um, I when I wrote this up maybe a week ago, I don't remember over the weekend, whatever it was. Um, we're going to go based off of that, and uh, so right now, um, RPs one through five are Liam Hendricks, Josh Hader, Russell Iglesias, Emmanuel Classe, and Edwin Diaz. Um, I'm going to start with you, Victor, uh, give me one RP in this grouping that you think is going too high. And one that you think is, you think maybe is going a little too low. I think almost by default, it has to be Liam Hendricks as the one that's going too high. Um, not necessarily anything specifically against him, but I think within this group, since he's the first one going in drafts and I don't, uh, see any clear flaws among the five i would probably say hendrix is the one that's going a little a little too high um obviously nothing against him specifically again just by default almost and i think edwin diaz would probably be the pick for too low just because i think he has he has a lot of security in his role right now and with the moves the mets have made this offseason they look like uh they're going to be going to be a competitive team uh, more competitive than uh, the Cleveland Guardians even. So I think I would probably have Diaz as the reliever in this group that's probably not going high enough. What about you, Mike? Um, I, I'm i saying hater for me. I mean, I, I've seen the ADP on him and NFBC being at 55, 57. I think that's really a high price for him. And I'm a little worried about him, to tell the truth. I mean, I think if you take a little deeper dive into him, there's some things that make me kind of pause, you know, 10.7% walk rate. The ERA was low last year. I know we're not real big ERA guys here, but <laughs> it was a run a run higher. And I know it's still low, but I mean, what happens if some of those balls start turning into hits and those walks start turning into more runs? You know, it, it wouldn't surprise me to see his ERA go up to somewhere between three and a half and four while still getting a lot of saves and strikeouts. But I don't want that for my number one guy. I think that's too high. I think I'm just worried that, I mean, I don't think there's really anyone behind him right now that could overstep him, but mm -hmm. I mean, we don't ever see them going back to throwing him like as a seven, eight guy. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Not as long as they have Devin seven, Williams. Eight, right. You know right. I mean? Like, unless they flip flop that, which there had been some talk of last year, but I've not heard any of that since then. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and there's I, still the looming possibility that he does get traded. So that's true. We don't Good know point, how Victor. that would change anything. Yep. I think the guy that I have rated too low is Class A. And I, I, I know, you know, when we were in Arizona, Curlin kept screaming, you can't take victory laps, you can't take victory laps. But <laughs> if you go back to the first thing that I wrote uh, last year in the bullpen stuff, I picked Class A over Karinchek to be the closer. I just saw that shaking out differently. And it, it's not rocket science, right? Like Victor knows this. He does the same thing I do. I listened to what Terry Francona said. Terry Francona is saying, uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but I think I want to use Kernchik in the fifth inning. I'm like, okay, well, he's not going to be the closer. Um, <laughs> it's 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 pretty simple. But Class A is really, really good. And honestly, mm -hmm. I think he's another guy, you know, granted, people are going to be a little scared because they're going to have the Kernchik in the in the wind, in the the rearview mirror and worried about him. But he's got his own set of problems that he had last year and showed that he wasn't really ready for the job. Uh, context matters to me here. And Class A was a guy that – they traded a still pr fairly in his prime Corey Kluber for this guy, right? Yeah. So now Corey Kluber's with the Rays for Victor. Nice. I think that's a good move for you guys. But <laughs> they, they, this this context matters, you know. He lags a little bit in K-rate, but he had 24 saves last year in a split role with Karinchek. Um, they didn't get him. They didn't get him from Texas to sit him down. I think he's going to be the guy, and I think he's going to be undervalued. If he if he's the tenth closer off the board right now, which I've seen happen in some drafts, I mean, give me all of that all day, you know. Yeah, I, I love Class A. And I think that um, I'm hoping that he's undervalued. I hope that people are mm -hmm. like, you know what? Um, I'm scared off because he doesn't have elite, you know, uh, K rates, you know, and I want people to be, you know, I want people to uh, not buy into him and be scared about that and be scared about a role. Um, Cause I think that he is one of 
the closers that can totally get get pushed up. I think that he could be a game changer this season. Um, and I'm a huge Class A fan. I think that he's got great skills. Uh, you know, and he can rely he he can get away with a lower strikeout rate because he is such a high ground ball uh, pitcher. I think in all of you know uh, the relievers last year, I think he had the third highest uh, ground ball rate. It was like 68 or 69 percent, something like that. And um, it's just like so he can get away with that, and that's okay because I still think that. Um, I, I still think it's just, I don't know. I love class A and I want people to not think that he's that great. <laughs> I, I agree with you. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I, I wish I listened to you last year, Mike, because I fell for the whole wicker and thing and that didn't turn out so well. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, let's blame, let's blame Doug. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I mean, he loved the Nilsson Lamette, so he probably loved the wicker as well. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to the next grouping here. Um, so this is going to be uh, relief pitchers six through ten. Uh, six going off the board is Ryan mm-hmm. Presley, then Aroldis Chapman, then Kenley Jansen, then Will Smith, and Giovanni Gallegos. Uh, Victor, who's going too high? Who's going too low in this grouping? I think for me, Will Smith is the reliever that stands out as someone that I don't, um, don't probably won't be drafting at least in this range. Um, the signing of Kirby Yates, albeit he hasn't uh, pitched much over the last couple of seasons, coming back from Tommy John, but um, when he does return from from his surgery, I think he has the upside to overtake uh, Will Smith before the season's over. And generally, I think Will Smith might. Uh, pitch himself out of the role if his um, home run problem continues. He had mm-hmm. a fly ball rate around 47%, mm-hmm. had an XFIP over four. His Sierra was much lower than that, but if he continues to give up home runs at the rate that he is and fly balls at the rate that he is, he might pitch himself out of the role. And it seemed um, that this isn't an analy- analytical argument, but just from watching a lot of Braves games, it seems like uh, Will Smith was always on the edge of edge of disaster and was able to get out of a lot of those types of situations. So if a few of them go a different way, the Braves might be looking elsewhere, even uh, maybe Tyler Matzak who showed out in the postseason. Yeah, I, I don't, I think Yates um, they're saying won't be back till like June, maybe July. Mm -hmm. So I feel like even then they're going to give him time to, you know, um, I guess ramp up and really trust him. But um, yeah, I mean, if you're okay with Will Smith's skill set, I think you're fine drafting because I think he's obviously going to get all those opportunities. Um, but if you're someone like you are worried about the home runs a little bit, mm-hmm. then he's definitely not someone really to buy into because he's probably – he very well could easily lose it by the end of the year as well once uh, they start trusting Yates a little more uh, coming off that injury. Mm-hmm. Who's someone too low for you, Victor? I think in this group, I'd probably lean towards Giovanni Gallegos. I think um, he might have the skills similar to uh, Rizel Iglesias, a potential top five Mm -hmm. closer. Uh, The question is, are the Cardinals going to commit to him full time as the closer? And last September, it looked like um, it it was clear that they were. Obviously, Mike Schill isn't the manager anymore, so they might have a change of heart in Mm -hmm. terms of what they want to do with the closer job with the closer job in St. Louis. But I do think if Gallegos does find himself in a full-time closer role, that he he could be, probably be the best, maybe second best to Ryan Presley among the relievers in this group. Mm-hmm. What about you, Mike? Who do you think is going too low here? Too low for me. I agree with uh, Victor on Gallegos. I mean, I I think at some point, if you're if you're St. Louis, you have to be done playing with this Alex Reyes and and <laughs> Jordan Hicks thing. I mean. How long have we been waiting for those guys to, you know, be injury free and be, be lights out? Now, Reyes, in his defense, was really good in the first half of the season and then hit the wall really hard, right? So he was probably being overused, to, to be honest. He doesn't have the arm that is going to allow him to be closing every day. Um, I think Gallegos really is another guy that can sneak into the top 10 for sure. He, he ran with the job in September. Um, a lot of people had drafted him and stashed him, hoping that that would come sooner. But he helped win a lot of leagues in September and October with 14 saves down the stretch, you know. So I like I like him a lot too. And then what about who you think's going too high? But I I last year I saw a Roldis Chapman and he was so jacked. I was like, oh my god, he looks beautiful. <laughs> like his body, everything is sculpted. This guy's gonna throw the ball through the wall, and he did. Except his ERA was three, almost three and a half. His walk percentage was over 15%. Uh, he's still got the incredible strikeout rate, but he's clearly slipping. And uh, he's 33. 
and he, he's it's a slippery slope for closers. There's a lot of arms, a lot of arms, a lot of miles on that arm is what I meant to say. And I'm, I'm just worried about that. He's also got competition there realistically, too. If he fades, they've got a couple of guys that they could plug in and go with for a period of time. I'm okay with him as your second closer, but I would never take him anymore as my top closer again. I don't think I would ever do that. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to ask about uh, Chapman and see what you guys thought about him because of you know some of the points that you referenced, Mike. Was you know you saw his his uh, walk rate um, jump to fifteen point six percent. He had a career worst uh, hard hit rate that spiked uh, to forty yep. percent. And you know he had like an elbow. He had like elbow infl- inflammation, so I'm sure that played a part of it. But on the flip side, he, he was still, you were, he was still able to squeeze out 30 um, saves. Right. right. I mm-hmm. think that he does have a fairly lo- longish leash. I, I, mm-hmm. or I, yeah, you know, he and he's going into a contract year too. So, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, I don't know. I, I mean, that was, that was, you kind of led me into, you know, my question, like, what do you guys think of that? You, I guess Mike are like, eh, you're kind of wary a little bit. Yeah, and I'm a little, to be honest, I'm a little worried about the Yankees. I don't really mm. see what their what their plan is at this point. Obviously, they didn't spend you know half a billion dollars like the Rangers did this week, right? But mm-hmm. what, what, they have to improve, right? They have yeah. if they want to be with the big guys in the AL East, they got to do something different, and they seem pretty stagnant right now. So yeah. if they're going to go into it the same way they did last year, that could limit some of his opportunities and make me kind of want to look elsewhere. It's mm-hmm. just that that idea of, I think Michael coined the term a couple of years ago, painful saves. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just, it's, is it worth getting the save if the guy gives up two runs? You know what I mean? It's like, it's mm-hmm. in, in, depending on your league context, it might not be. And I mm-hmm. had him in a points league last year. He was killing me. Um, mm-hmm. I ended up moving him and I made a couple of moves and it ended up working out for me. But I don't know. I mean, I think it depends yeah. on your context, but if you're, if you're Lauren, I think you're absolutely right. If your idea is I need to get 30 saves, he's probably a pretty safe bet for it. Mm-hmm. Victor, what do you think? Do you? Oh, I it... think, <laughs> sorry. Oh, oh, that's okay. Oh yeah. yeah. I didn't know what you thought about uh, Chapman. Oh yeah. So for Chapman, I, I think he would probably be second to Will Smith on in this group of who I think is overdrafted mm-hmm. just because he has the injuries. He's getting older now. And like Mike referenced, the the Yankees do have a stable of some pretty good young relievers. Uh, Chad Green, not as effective last year, but he definitely has the stuff to be a closer at some point. And Jonathan Loizaga uh, mm-hmm. had a very good 2021 season. So I'm not particularly in on Aroldis Chapman, especially at the, the potential price that he's going at. So I agree with Mike. I don't think I would take him as an RP1. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lauren, Lauren, I would go back to you on that too, right? You were, we were just talking about Class A, right? Mm-hmm. So what you hope is that somebody will take Chapman as like the fifth or sixth closer overall and thus yeah. drop, drop another guy further down to you that you would rather have anyway, right? That's so true, yeah. See what happens. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you both real quick too. Um, if Kenley Jansen goes back to the Dodgers, are you taking him as a top 10 RP? Yes. Likely the back end of the top 10, yes. Okay. If he doesn't, do you he's put Trinan up there? Yes. He, Not oh, he's, I feel like he's. I his think skill I, set is so nice. <laughs> definitely, I think he might be higher than Kenley if Kenley were the Dodgers. Like if we're comparing Kenley closing for the Dodgers yeah. and Trinan closing mm-hmm. for the Dodgers, I think I'd probably prefer Trinan actually. Mm-hmm. I want to get. I want to guess Kenley goes there though. I think Which they're the like Dodgers? kind of weirdly a perfect match for each other. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like that's why he's been successful i feel like if he goes anywhere else there's just i think it'll be a disaster what i want to have happen is i want them to not sign kenley trade for kimbrell and give us gavin lux that's what i want is that is that too much is that too much (laughs) (laughs) all right let's move on to the next group we're going to do rps 11 through 20 here um it's going to start off with jordan romano at 11 12 will be mark melanson uh, 13 will be Craig, Craig, uh, Craig Kimbrell. Uh, 14 will be Camilla Duvall. 15, Scott Barlow. 16, Gregory Soto. 17, David Bednar. 18, Blake Trainin, who we just discussed. 19, Joe Barlow. And 20, Ken Giles. Victor, who do you think is going too high right here? Um, I got to say Ken Giles kind of stood out to me on this part of the list because um, – he doesn't have the closer role promised to him when he returns from surgery. Mm-hmm. He hasn't pitched in al- almost two years. 
Um, I just think it's kind of odd to see him grouped with pitchers who were both healthy, were effective in 2021, and do have um, at least closed partially in 2021. So I don't think I would be taking Ken Giles at this point in the draft. I think he would be more of an endgame speculative pick than someone I would be taking to slot into my starting lineup at the beginning of the season. So Giles did stand out to me on this part of the list. I guess people are still holding on to that 2019 he had, and that's probably why. You yeah. know what? I, you know what I wonder about with Giles too, guys. I and mean, this is an interesting point I think to to think about. There are some guys that just have to close and don't have another purpose in a bullpen, right? So mm-hmm. if you look at Seattle's bullpen, they've got three other guys there: and Seawald, Steckenrider, and Andres Munoz, who I know yes. is on our on everybody's list right now. Yep. <laughs> they can all they can all do other things and pitch in other parts of the game. And Scott Service did that last year with those guys, right? So mm-hmm. you might be in a situation where where I totally agree with Victor that Giles is probably the least talented of that bunch, but he might end up being the closer anyway. Mm-hmm. I will say, I think, I think just like if Giles is healthy, I think he might be the best reliever in that bullpen. I'm just mm-hmm. yeah. concerned about whether he will be healthy or not. That's mm-hmm. a great point. I think it's fair. Yeah. Who thinks going too low, Victor? I think um, just based off of upside, Camilo Doval is the pitcher in this group who could potentially elevate himself into the top five uh, relievers. Uh, the way he pitched in September was pretty incredible. He didn't give up a run through his last, I think, 16 innings um, right into the postseason until the last game. So I think between the stuff that he has, the potential for the Giants to be uh, maybe not a 107 win team, but maybe mm-hmm. an 85 to 95 win team. Um, if he is able to overtake Jake McGee and uh, Tyler Rogers, mm-hmm. I think it is, mm-hmm. uh, in that bullpen. I think Doval has the upside to be well worth his price here. But I also want to mention Gregory Soto just because A.J. Hinch uh, said that uh, he that Soto is already the closer going he into did. spring yeah. training. Yeah, so I think Soto might be a little um, – might be somewhat of a value here if he's guaranteed the role heading into the season, unlike a lot of other pitchers in this range. Mike, do you, do you remember who loved seemed to love Soto at first pitch? No, I don't remember. It's Greg Jewett. Oh yeah, yeah. Greg loves him. He yeah, was like true. all over Soto. Um, all right, Mike, who do you think's going too high here? Uh, Joe Barlow for me. I mean, I I just don't believe for a second that the Rangers aren't going to add another reliever <laughs> here. I mean, they literally, they literally. I know I said this before, and I'm I'm neurotic about it, and I posted about it on on Twitter the other day. They just spent half a billion dollars on Monday and Tuesday, right? Sunday and Monday to, mm-hmm. to, to shore up the middle infield, right? So they added Calhoun. They've added Joe Barlow being the guy that's going to be their closer if they're really serious about going into the season winning. Um, again, I would I would like to offer my friend Craig Krimble, uh, K- Kimbrell here. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe they can give us a second baseman and an outfielder. I don't know. Um, but honestly, I think Barlow made a did a really nice job with his opportunity last year. But his stuff doesn't really strike me as the – he's got a good slider. He's got a pretty average fastball. But I don't know how long he can make that work. I mean, seems like he might be better suited in a different role. Although, to his credit, he did a really nice job when he had the opportunity. Um, too low, I too agree low. with Victor said on, Do- on Doval. But I want another guy to add here, which is uh, David Bednar. And um, I really think Bednar is the guy there because who else is there? I mean, yeah. they, you know, they traded Richard Rodriguez. They plugged him in later than what I thought they were going to. They're probably going to do something stupid like use Chris Stratton. But, you know, <laughs> this guy had a 33% K percentage last year, 77 strikeouts and 60 innings, uh, three saves, three wins, 2.23 ERA, whip under one. I mean, I just would like to encourage Pittsburgh to be a little sexier here. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I think Bednar would be the guy that I would go with there uh, over their other options. And I, I think he's going to go lower in drafts because people just don't know him yet, you know. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, and there's some cloudiness to that role in Pittsburgh. But I would have no problem taking him as, uh, as my number two guy at this point. Um, let me ask you both. Uh, Scott Barlow, do we think he's going to stick as the closer? Do we think Stomont will actually finally take over? Or what do you guys I th- think? I think it's going to be a fluid situation. Uh, Barlow at the end of September was their regular closer. But I think part of that likely was um, just the weirdness of Mike Matheny and how the Royals operate. I don't think that's going to sustain for a full season. So, um I don't know if Barlow is necessarily being overdrafted just because he is likely to be the primary save 
source in the Royals bullpen, but I don't think he's going to be a 30, a 30 save uh, closer. Mm-hmm. You know what they're going to do, don't you guys? They're going to do something. They're going to do something real stupid, and they're going <laughs> to they're going to do like, oh, we're, we're going to sign Trevor Rosenthal for ten million dollars this year because <laughs> this team this team loves to collect average middle relievers, and then and then try to trade them off during the regular season, right? So, um, you know, I, I like I like Barlow better than Stomont just from the eye test and looking at him, but I I just could see them doing something like bringing in somebody that they shouldn't. That's a retread and not giving those guys the opportunity. They seem really loath to give them the opportunity. I don't know why. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too, though, because I think with Stomont, I was just reading something uh, the other day saying that, you know, he had COVID and it really, he was just ravaged. He lost like 30, 30 pounds. And, yeah. you know, it's just like yeah. he was completely fatigued. And so I'm actually kind of interested in him in terms of um, kind of a, a bounce back, you know, yeah. and maybe he's not going to be, uh, say a full blown traditional closer, but I think that he could get more play this season, and it, I think that he will be undervalued because you know because he was so off last season. So I kind of like point. him as a sneaky pick, you know. Which is that's, yeah, that's really which sneaky. is uh, kind of crazy to say because I mean he did pitch well last year, just the strikeout mm-hmm. rate dipped dramatically. So uh, I mean, as I think as long as he gets that back, maybe you know he could have a and- shot there. Yeah. And that could be because he was sick, like Lauren said. You know, I mean, right, exactly. I already have low energy at my age, and I don't have COVID. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. Uh, there's that humor we love, Mike. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about next. We're just gonna talk about four bullpens real quick that are kind of a mess, and uh, just kind of discuss who we think is gonna kind of be the relief pitcher to own in that bullpen. Uh, so we're going to start off with the obvious one, Victor's team over here, uh, Tampa Bay Rays. Victor, who do you think is the relief pitcher to own in that bullpen? I think to start the season, I would probably be taking Andrew Kittredge mm-hmm. first among uh, Rays relievers. Not that confidently. I don't think they're going to have a set reliever going into the season. But Kittredge was their best reliever in 2021. Um, he'll presumably be on the team for 2022, although you never know with the Rays. So I think Kittredge would be who I want to start the season with. I don't think I don't want to overlook Pete Fairbanks, though, just based off mm-hmm. of the stuff and um, what the Rays gave up for him in Nick Solak. I think there's some equity there and they might um, try and plug him into the role if he's able to uh, be more consistent than he was this past season. I actually uh, just listened to a, um, oh my gosh, the Eno Saris podcast, Rates of Barrels. Rates Rates of Barrels. And Eno mentioned that Kittredge was actually like top five in terms of his stuff metric. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in the, I don't know if it's relievers or the league overall, but either way, I was was a little surprised with that. But I do like Kittredge as well. Do you agree, Mike? Yeah, I think, you know, I've I've made the Nick Anderson mistake a couple of times thinking I could slip him under the wire and he would be productive for mm-hmm. me and then he's gotten hurt. But let's be realistic here. It's Tampa. They're going to have 10 they're going to have at least 10 guys that have at least one thing. <laughs> it's just the way that it is. Yeah. Now Kittredge is amazing. Um his his K rate's pretty pedestrian, but the ground ball percentage last year was like 54% for the whole year. 54% that's higher than Doug's high school chemistry grade, I think, probably. <laughs> so, but the thing that I love about what Tampa does is that they just get guys and they let them do what they're good at. You know, they don't try to reinvent the wheel. They don't try to make them learn new pitches. They get these guys, their scouting reports, and then they make them be decent again, right? Look at, yeah. at several examples. You got Jeffrey Springs, Ryan Thompson, Matt Whistler. Fire Ryzen. I mean, they get these guys that nobody's ever heard of and they're productive for them. So I agree that it's Kittredge probably to start the season, but who knows if he implodes or goes back to what he was for the most of part of his career, it could be a wide open situation. And Nick Anderson's, I mean, we know what he really can do when he's healthy. Um, mm. So it, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. And I know Victor, you had brought up um, Brooks Rayleigh. Do you think that uh, he could be a contender for saves? I mean, I know it's the Rays, but. Yeah, I think he might pick up some saves when there are lefties coming up in the ninth. But looking at his splits, he's been much, much more effective against lefties than righties. So I have hmm. uh, a suspicion that that might be the type of role the Rays are looking at okay. him to be to fill this Match year. Up. Yeah. Now, Mike, you mentioned Nick Anderson. <clears throat> Do you guys think he's worth a roster spot at all this year? I, not off the bat, I don't think. Um, I, I just I don't see it. I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had a surgery on his elbow, I think, so he won't even be pitching till like July. So right. I don't think it's mm-hmm. worth chasing at all. At all. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, for me as um, when I draft for fantasy baseball, obviously, um, I try and stay away from anything elbow, um, you know, yeah. pure P, anything like that. Forget it. I don't even bother. They're off my board. Yeah, UCL um, brace surgery to be specific. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to the uh Philadelphia Phillies. Victor, who's the RP to own in that bullpen? So, as of today, it's Corey Knable. Um, I <laughs> right. wasn't really expecting the uh, Corey Knable to show up as a closer at this point in the offseason, but it looks like as of today, at least, he's going to be the closer. Although, I wouldn't put it past the Phillies to sign Kenley Jansen or trade for Craig Kimbrell. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> it's, Mike it's, just wants him off the team. <laughs> well, it, it was funny because the rumor going around earlier on White Sox Twitter, meatball Twitter with the White Sox fans was <laughs> that they were going to trade Kimbrel to the Phillies and get um, um, Gene oh, Segura. Segura. Yeah. I'm like, are you are you kidding me? Come on, man. That ain't right. Mm. But I, I agree. I think it's Corey Knable at first, too. But I mean, it's Dave Dombrowski, right? So he's going to throw a bunch of money at somebody and it's going to be stupid money at some point. Mm-hmm. There's some guys that are floating around. Maybe it's Kimbrel. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's Kenley. Maybe it's not. But they've got other options there too that that you know that they use during the season. Uh, Jose Alvarado, Connor Brogdon is a guy that they've been really high on for a number of years. Um, you know, the other thing is too, depending on what they what direction they go with their rotation, do they revisit using Ranger Suarez as closer? Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think that they do, but it's an option. Well, I mean, that's a great point because if he does struggle early on, like let's say he's 10, 15 starts in and he's just struggling out there, why would they not think about putting him back in the bullpen? Exactly my thought. So it's a, a great point. Yeah, we'll see. It's a possibility. I, mean, I would be yeah. drafting Ranger Suarez anyway as a starter. So absolutely. I, well, I was going to say that kind of like makes him more intriguing as a draft pick because. Even if he struggles, there's that potential of him then putting him back in the bullpen and maybe, yeah. you know, get vulturing some saves. Absolutely, it's kind of it's kind of crazy how he. I feel like he has a lot of avenues to really work out for you, you Absolutely. know, where he's being drafted. For sure. Um, all right, let's move on to the Mariners. Um, who do you guys think takes the? Who do you think is the RP to own in that bullpen? I know we mentioned a couple names before, um, you know, like Giles and uh, Andres Munez. So, what do you guys think? I think I would be drafting Paul Seawald first among this group, but I would not be drafting any of them particularly high at this point. Um, I think Ken Giles is worth a speculative speculative pick uh, late in drafts. I think Diego Castillo could be someone that they turn to for saves at some point in the season. Mm-hmm. What about um, Stecken Rider? Yeah, I th- personally, I'm not high on Stecken Rider. I think a lot of the improvements he made last year – um, could be due for some regression. Uh, he did a lot. He did very well on fly balls, and I think if his home run rate increases without a corresponding increase to his strikeout rate, he could find himself struggling a little bit. So I think, uh, based off of skills, Seawald and Castillo, I think are better pitchers than Second Rider, even if Second Rider uh, had the better ERA and was closing more often than them. Uh, for most of 2021. And then obviously Andres Munoz, who just got an extension, uh, he might be another guy that you might, you could be taking at in the end game of drafts. Although I think he might be more of a waiver guy uh, Mm -hmm, when we start mm -hmm. the season in most 12 teamers. Okay. So Seawold for you, do you agree, Mike? Yeah. I mean, I think Stecken Ryder, Victor makes a great point about him. I mean, it's kind of like looking at me from far away. It looks like it's okay. And then you get real close. You're like, Oh shit. I don't want any, I want nothing to do with this. <laughs> That's not true. Mike. No, no, it's That's true. Not true. There's a, there's a, I met you in real life. That's not true. Oh yeah. You have met me in real life. unfortunately. Um, but, it, but in all honesty, I do think Seawald is probably the first guy that you would take off. Um, and I, I don't think that, um, any of those are guys that I would draft high just because of the uncertainty of this bullpen. I think if you are in a dynasty league or a keeper league, Munoz is a really interesting guy to think about because he's coming off the arm surgery. As Victor said, he just signed a four-year extension. They bought out his free agency, seven and a half million dollars with the ability to make more than that. So he's got some money coming his way. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know that he'll be the guy that they would go to right away, but you know that they're going to groom him for that role. I would not surprise me at all if he was the closer next year. It would not surprise me at all if he was the closer at the end of this year. Um, 
but at Seawall to me is the guy that I would take first. And those other guys are fine to take two as options for, for, um, you know, just speculation towards the end of a draft. But uh, I think Seawall for me too. I think it's interesting because the Mariners bullpen kind of reminds me of Tampa Bay's in yeah. that, uh, you know, it's like you look at, at both of these teams and um, combined, they had 34 uh, relievers that had at least one save. Like that's crazy, you know? And I think that, you know, to your point, I think that no matter who you think is, um, going to be the closer. I think you can, this is another team where, you know, you can kind of do those spec picks and you may pick up a guy that, you know, g- gives you three saves or four right. saves, you know? Right. And so I think that, and you know, they've got two young arms, you know, with Seattle, they have Munoz and then, um, with Tampa Bay, they have Colby white where it's just like, okay, mm-hmm. well maybe these guys are worth, yes. uh, you know, picking up and seeing, you know, they, they could be starting in triple a or, or whatever, but they could, be an impact arm at some point in the season. And, um, you know, I don't know, Seattle just used a lot of arms last, last year, um, which is kind of surprising, but again, you know, if you're drafting, I think it makes sense to, you know, pick up one of these guys on the fly. Cause you may, like I said, you may get like three steals, uh, three saves out of it. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think we didn't uh, even mention uh Casey Sadler. He had a 0.67 mm-hmm. ERA last year. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's just that it's a really interesting time for bullpens, which is why we're having this conversation. Right. I mean, it's just yep. it's so hard to know exactly how things are going to mm-hmm. work out. And I, I love that point, Lauren, about them being like Tampa. It's really similar. I mean, Victor, how many times last year in the summertime did you go to bed on a Saturday night? Now, you're a young guy. I'm an old guy. So <laughs> I'm trying to stay up and watch the late night games. And I'm drooling on myself, the MLB games on the West Coast. Right. <laughs> And I wake up and I'm like, okay, you know what? I got Seawall this week on a waiver wire pick. And then I look at the Sunday box score and Steckenrider gets the save. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? They say, how many times? I mean, the, Seattle's famous for it. And Service is a mm-hmm. really good manager. He knows what he's doing. He likes to play those matchups. He knows mm-hmm. he knows the plan, similar to Kevin Cash. So this is a really tough one to call, guys. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Now, now let me ask you both a question. If you're playing in the DC format and let's say you want to wait on saves, do you think it's a – good idea or at least interesting idea to maybe just wait and own like three or four guys from the Mariners bullpen and just kind of nail down that bullpen. I do. I think if you can, that'd be an interesting strategy. I guess who would be the, that was brought up in at first pitch. I think someone someone brought that up and I thought that was a pretty interesting idea as well. So who would be the three or four guys you, you would want though from the Mariners. Yeah. For the Mariners. I mean, I guess you'd have to think, Stecken Rider, Seawold, Giles. Maybe Giles. Giles is the wild card. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's For tough. Sure. I mean, you could go to you, know. you could go to other bullpens where, you know, it's easier. You know, you go to the Yankees and just grab Chapman and Eliza well, and whatnot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but you gotta pay for Chapman there. Yeah, yeah, All, right. Yeah. All right, we got one more uh bullpen we're gonna talk about, and that's the Colorado Rockies. Um oh, I'm out. I don't <laughs> <laughs> shut it down. This actually <laughs> is it worth rostering a Rockies relief pitcher at all? Start with you, Victor. I think it goes back to what uh, Mike was talking about earlier with the painful saves. I think it's a format dependent type of thing. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, if you're in a points league where you're losing points for giving up hits and runs, um, I don't know if Daniel Bard or Carlos Estevez provided that much value to you in 2021. But for in uh, season long roto leagues, um, whether Daniel Bard gives up one or two runs likely isn't going to affect your ERA in the grand scheme of things that much. So I think it's a lot easier to get away with those types of uh, low four, mid four ERA types of closers. I know I had some leagues where I was relying on Daniel Bard for quite a while and it wasn't pretty, but he was definitely getting saved. So I think Mm -hmm. it's a format dependent thing on whether you can trust or not necessarily trust, but use a Colorado closer. Mike, would you own one? Victor or is roster far, one. Sorry, Victor is far smarter than me. Um, I I would not take Bard. I, Estevez intrigued me for a while, and then he showed his true colors, uh, mm-hmm. and it, it didn't go real well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think I I just don't understand what Colorado's doing right now. They, they, now there's anyone about, they're talking about like have you, you seen know, the way they treat their young players i mean well sure but you've got you know they're now they're talking about bringing trevor story back i'm like trevor story yeah. run to chicago play second base for the white Sox. 
you know, Jack, well, I'll, you, Jack will come and give you entertainment every day. <laughs> but in reality, I mean, um, they have a couple of guys there that might be interesting in the right situation. And I think Victor says it really is league dependent. They have another young guy there named Lucas Gilbreth that I'm a little bit interested in, um, who had a pretty nice year last year under the radar. Mm-hmm. Nobody really knows who he was. He's a possibility. I just don't see them spending money on anybody to bring in as a closer. So if you have to chase saves, um, you could do worse maybe. Um, but I, I think it's um, it's dependent on what your format is and, wh- and how badly those things are going to hurt you if you own them. Yeah, I think Gilbraith is kind of an interesting one. My f- like kind of fear with the Rockies is a little bit like what we touch upon is that it's the Rockies. And I feel that they, you know, they love veterans so much. And I don't think that they give their young uh, players in general, you know, a ton of opportunity or a consistent opportunity to perform. And so for me, I would be concerned if you picked up one of these young guys um, that they would either just go back to Bard or I wouldn't be surprised if they brought a veteran in knowing the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And all of this is just like, we've just been wasting our time talking about it because they could bring in like, I don't know, some veteran closer. And that's, they're like, yeah, that's what we're going to roll with. It's, it's going to be Ian Kennedy. It wouldn't Kennedy. surprise me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it would, oh, like geez. that would not surprise me at all. So it's just, it's the Rockies and altitude Rockies, that combo, I feel like it's just like, stay away. <laughs> even, I, uh... even, even better. They could bring in Ian Desmond to close. They still, there you go. Them. There you go. <laughs> and they would think that's a really good idea. That's you a great know? They'd be like, yeah, this is a good one. Oh my this. God. <laughs> You know who I love there, but he keeps getting hurt in the blood clots is Scott Oberg. Oberg, Oberg I yeah. loved Oberg, but he might, he might he might not ever pitch again though, Mike. So I know. Unfortunately, yeah. it's I hard know. to say. I'll still I'll still draft him anyway. <laughs> I think another weird thing about the Rockies is they're mm-hmm. as a team they're so much better at home, but mm-hmm. most of their relievers don't pitch better at home. Right. So mm-hmm. there's this kind of weird interplay mm-hmm. where their relievers they're not pitching very well in mm-hmm. cores but most of their wins and save opportunities are coming in cores so it's, it makes it even more of a headache right. if you're going to be rostering one of these guys oh yeah mm. yeah yep. yeah Just it makes point. it yeah. nearly impossible all right that does it for the serious stuff so now we're going to ask some fun questions oh, for boy. you guys questions that you don't know um mm-hmm. we'll alternate here lauren okay. i'll go first you go okay. second um, all right, first question. Who wins in a fight, Aroldis Chapman or Amir Garrett? Ooh. I would have to go with <laughs> Chapman. Ooh, okay. The reason, yeah, you have to go with Chapman because Chapman will bring a weapon. <laughs> <laughs> Garrett, Garrett will just use his fist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I should have said who would win in a fist fight then. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was really inappropriate. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's fine. I saw an Instagram post of uh, Aroldis Chapman standing next to Albert Pujols. He made Pujols look like a, yes, a kid. Yes, I remember so. that. Which is oh, crazy. Huh, interesting. Chapman is huge. a big dude. <clears throat> big dude. Okay, guys. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Absolutely not. I do not think so. No. I'm okay. with you guys. I don't think okay. so either. No, the better question is ask Simeon what he puts on a hot dog. You wouldn't. You wouldn't, you wouldn't you it's wouldn't, completely normal. It is not, what do you put on there? Not, it is not. I, I put ketchup and mustard. Oh, oh. yeah. No, I do that. Is yeah. That, see? What are, you, are you guys five? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that because Victor's probably fairly good. <laughs> I'm not big on mustard myself, but I, I don't think it's that odd. Thank you. Know. You guys all got to come to Chicago and I'll get you a real hot dog, okay? I oh, promise. Yeah, I would you. do that. All right. Yeah. Real hot dogs, okay. no ketchups, Mike. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> all right. This one's a fun one. What is a conspiracy theory that you actually believe? Hmm. <laughs> or that you want to admit that you believe? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Hmm. To be honest, I don't even think I could believe one. That's I don't know. Really I don't, yeah, I don't know what I would. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think the closest I come to thinking of and believing in a conspiracy theory is <clears throat> like the, the assassination of JFK. Was I was not, actually gonna say was that. not a was not it was not a one man deal. There's no uh... way that. that there's no way yeah. that that skinny, wacky dude in Dallas was doing that by himself. <laughs> no. And he had a car that was moving that fast. Come on. I mean, I don't buy it. 
I, I could latch on to that one too. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. we all we all agree that Trump lost the election in twenty twenty, right? <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's that like is that. not a conspiracy theory. <laughs> um, okay. Well, what is a weird fact that you know? Oh my! God. I have a I have a weird one. Okay. Oh, Did man. you guys know that Nintendo owns the right to a porno film? <laughs> No, no, yeah, why do you know that? I wonder if I've seen it. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I don't remember the specifics, it had something to obviously do with like people dressed up as Mario and Luigi and stuff, but um, yeah, I I forgot why why it happened. I watched like a whole documentary on the history of Nintendo, so that's why I know. (laughs) Interesting, they also started as like a card trading company too before they were really into video games, and they're actually extremely. Um, and a really old company. I think they're from like the 1800s, which probably. Wow. Know. But yes, they own rights to a porn. Oh. Well, that's Ooh. interesting. <laughs> I guess. Doesn't I Hideki say... Matsui have an extremely large um, porn? Like he had like like the largest like porn collection of like all the Yankees or something. Oh, and it was like, maybe that's a weird fact that I know. <laughs> that I is know. a weird fact that you know. Right? <laughs> Lauren, like Lauren, is there anything else you want to tell us? What's going on here? <laughs> When you said Hideki Matsui had the biggest and then paused, I was like, what's going to happen now? What inside information does oh Lauren have here? Uh, I guess yeah. I guess I found um, I found out that the character Olimar, uh, he's a character in the video game Super Smash Bros. Apparently mm-hmm. he's the size of a nickel in his actual like uh, game. Oh. Okay, I didn't know that. I don't know if like. that's weird enough. I feel like Mike would have a million of these now. Going going back to our Kennedy assassination thing, <laughs> did you know? Oh wait, 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 sorry. Is this the whole connection with Abraham Lincoln? Wait, did you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. Now you know that um, Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln, and Lincoln mm-hmm. had a secretary named Kennedy. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, I guess that's not so random. <laughs> that's <laughs> old news. Everyone knows this, Mike. <laughs> But I like that, you know, that was a fact that everyone knew. I like that we kind of, you know, wrap that up with that. We're like, oh, yeah, no, we know that. One <laughs> one weird fact about me is that you can't see it because you guys are far away. But if you look closely in my beard, I have one blue hair. Mm. Oh. oh. It's what? blue. I, I think it's because of all the acid I did in the 90s. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I can't be 100% sure. Do you all really? Right. You really have one blue hair? Yeah. I, if I can get if I can find it and do it, like, it's kind of thick right now, but it shows like up navy sometimes. blue like what color blue it's, it, no it's 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 weird yeah it's like a really dark <laughs> blue and and oh, i wow. people thought it was crazy i was like oh i said to my wife katie i'm like i got a blue hair here and she's just like come on it's just like <laughs> it's like stained with like your stupid cigar stuff or whatever i go no 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 look it it's clean look look That's it was crazy. blue hmm. yeah oh. it's really it's okay. really weird you gotta show me that next time yeah all right last question if you were arrested with no explanation, what would your friends and family assume you had done? Hmm. <laughs> I have a teenage daughter. <laughs> I know I where think, this is going. I think my friends would say that I was arrested for murder. <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> now, if it was 1995, it's a very different time. Very different time. That would probably be drunk and disorderly. Probably. <laughs> That's where I thought you were going to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what about you, uh, Victor? That's a good question. I feel like my parents would probably think um, I was probably driving recklessly because that's the, how they view my driving ability, something like that. <laughs> Speeding or reckless endangerment or yeah. something like that. Behind the wheel stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely driving. <laughs> If you're in Arizona, we got to get a car, and we're going to let Victor drive, and we'll we'll, we'll see. Oh yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I'll roll the dice. Let's do it. I'm not a I'm not even a bad driver. I'm just you know my parents kind of view it that way. But mm-hmm. if I'm driving you guys, I'll be extra safe though. I'll make sure. Of it. Oh no, I want you to be you. I want you to be you. <laughs> let's let's go. I have no adventure in my life. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to go to bed. That's it. I'm done. <laughs> I might be doing that too. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was a lot of fun. Thank you both for coming on. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I had a blast. Yeah, I think this is a really good opener, guys. This is our like the opening episode of the 2022 SP streamer season. So mm-hmm. I'm very happy that you guys were on. I had a great time. You guys are the best. Uh, this is this is a good debut, I think, you know. 
Awesome. Thank you guys for having us. Really great to meet both of you guys. I've known mm-hmm. Michael for way too long, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's perfect. We get Victor's voice, and then we get Mike's sense of humor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. Perfect match. Um, for those listening, you can follow Victor on Twitter at AwesomeVictorAA, and you can follow Mike Carter on Twitter at MDRC0508. you got to change that, man. you got to make it over. It's the Victor. worst Twitter handle of Come all on. time. Yeah. Just, you can't just make it like MDRC, and that's it? <laughs> Would that, that work? Taken? Can I can I do that? I mean, you could try. You can uh, see if I, it's taken. I mean, yeah, it's it's sort of I, yeah. I should do I should do that. I didn't really I really wasn't aware that I could change it. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can follow Lauren on Twitter at lk Auerbach, and you can follow me on Twitter at sp streamer. Uh, make sure you check out our website spstreamer.com. Um, check out our draft kit, which is up for pre order on our website. And uh, that about does it till next week. And thank you guys for listening. And we will talk to you soon.